But Melanie's pregnant? She's in my prayer group, duh. What men will do to you in prison is nothing compared to what demons will do to you in hell, on beds of fire, through all eternity. I'm gonna get you for this penalty. If you do, God will get you, Brandon, and it won't be pretty. You're gonna burn in hell! Welcome to Blood and Black Rum Podcast Halloween 2022 Special. This year we're Craven some Cronenberg. We're bringing you Wes Craven and David Cronenberg movies all Halloween season from September to October 31st. Experience the visceral thrills with movies like A Nightmare on Elm Street, Rabbit, Last House on the Left, and more. Hey guys, welcome back to the Blood and Black Rum Podcast. I'm Ryan from ColdSplotation.com, and I'm joined with my co-host, Martin. How's it going? Doing pretty well. Uh, we're getting to... Actually, I, I always start these out by saying, like, oh, we're neck deep in our Craven some Cronenberg series. But no, we're actually getting towards the tail end of our Craven some Cronenberg series. It's hard to believe, but Halloween's around the corner now. Ooh, spooky. Spooky season is upon us, and... Um, we're, Sunday scaries. Right, yeah. We're looking at quite a few uh, cool things releasing for, for Halloween this year. And uh, Halloween Ends is going to be coming up and showing us exactly how Michael Myers ends. Which well, we'll... I'm not watching it. I'm protesting as the second film, Halloween Kills, was being uh, trotted about as evil dies tonight. And it didn't. Yeah. It didn't die. So how can you trust somebody who says that it's going to end can't. I learned that lesson with Halo 3. Finish the fight. And then they released more. And then I stopped playing. Because you know what? No. I learned I that from my... Freddy's Dead. The Final Nightmare. I, I was going to say, I it thought Microsoft <laughs> Microsoft was telling the truth back in 2007. That mm-hmm. yes, we are finishing the fight. No, they sent Master Chief off to do some more foolish things. And 20 years later, people are still playing it. You know what? That just goes to show you that things just don't end. They just can't end. That's why there must be an afterlife, because all of these movies get afterlives, so... Things don't so, end. So, we've been lucky so far, uh, I must say, in this uh, little expedition of ours, because for the most part, uh, usually when we do these, it's filled with track. And it's we at I least picked them. I picked them I on say, purpose. We, I say <laughs> we at least hit some level of garbage along the way. Mm-hmm. And though Cronenberg, for the most part, hasn't been that enjoyable, Videodrome being pretty really good though. In all of my enjoyment coming out of uh, West's output so far, we're finally hitting. Uh, we're due. Ca- yeah. We're due for Costas Mandalore in the third Saw film and. Level of Drek. We were due. I had to pick one uh, from Wes's uh, later output, and because I, you know, I know that, and you know what, I, I, I honestly, I thought I had seen my soul to take, but I don't. I, after watching it, either I just like did the Men in Black like flash in my face to forget that it <laughs> ever happened, or I uh, d- didn't actually see it. But either way, I don't remember it at all. Um, who could blame you? Yeah. I mean... I, we at least, I, was saying, I was saying, so, like, we have, like, usually when we do these marathons, there is, like, it's usually a healthy mix of good and bad. It's been good and mediocre so far. Like, even when we did last year with Carpenter, we hit some shitty Carpenter, you know. We notes. hit it early, too. Yeah. With, yeah. Did we do so, Ghost, of, Ghost of Mars pretty early in that one? Oh, yeah, number three. Yeah, number three. so we hit it early. We we were like, nothing can compare to this one. We but, we, we hit the mother load of bad Carpenter movies. And, then we, and, and we did The War near the yeah, end, which yeah. wasn't even that bad, to be honest with you. It, just, yeah, I mean, know. again, like a lot of these movies, especially like when they come from bigger directors like Wes or from John Carpenter, you get to those movies and they're not truly terrible they're not bad bad movies um but they're like so forgettable in their canon that you just like don't even think about them. i don't i the one thing and 
we're talking about my soul to take today. But I, the one question, <laughs> shove that my, in there. I was saying, my, my, my one question is, well, no, because I'm kind of thinking about it. Like, so you had like mid 2000s, late, you know, early 2010s, this time period. Wes still has some cachet as a director. Carpenter still has some cachet as a director. George Romero has some cachet as a director, even though, because they're, you know, big names. Out of all of them, the only one to really get a shot at, like, a big fucking film was Romero with Land of the Dead. Like, that was actually, you know, well, you know, big budgeted, you know piece to kind of hang up and like it's kind of weird to kind of think about it because we're only 15 10 years out from like their lat all three of them's like last like you know kind of like hit hit it's kind of weird like you know that they got pigeonholed and if a studio green lit like you know them to do something that it was like incredibly bare bones Mm mm-hmm you know, it's I, I don't know. I just kind of find that you know a little you know weird. May, but maybe at the same time with their independent streak all, with all three of them, they kind of said, "Yeah, fuck it." You know, mm-hmm. I don't have control of my ideas, and fuck you. <laughs> right, and it, so like in talking about my soul to take, which is what one of Wes Craven's later movies, um, he had pre like so he had previously uh, just before this in. Um, I think it was it, 2000, yeah, right at the tail end. He had he had done Scream 3, right? He directed Scream 3. Yep. And then in 2005, he did Cursed, uh, which Red was... Re- yeah, and Red Eye. And Cursed was pretty poorly received. It was a, a movie that was supposed to be like Scream for the werewolf movie, right? Because you have Kevin Williamson writing. Um, boom. Like, and then in, in the 2000s too, especially like for like slasher type movies like it was like slap kevin williamson's name on it uh and you got yourself like a bona fide potential hit that that was what like new line and everybody was thinking like oh you know what grab kevin williamson let's see if i would have thought for I, us. I know but i would have thought by 2005 kevin williamson's like shtick as good as it was would have incredibly run through you can only do so many things like that like you can only say like all right he did scream great Great, awesome. He did, he, then he, he did the fa- he did the faculty. Great, great. You know? Then Halloween H two O. All right, well, you kind of running dry there, Kevin. And you know, it just like the the more you do that sort of thing, because he really only had one one theme, right? He he only had one specific idea that he could run through. I, I by two thousand five with Cursed, it was really run run dry, and it just was poorly received, and partially that was because of production issues. Um, meddling from production on oh Cursed. Oh my god. I but, had no idea. Sorry to interrupt. Kevin Williamson created Dawson's Creek? Mm-hmm. Yes, he did. I don't want to wait. Yeah. But back to... <laughs> back, back to what I was saying there. I, it is, it's just... Wow. I've been living a lie my entire life. Like... So you have this series of films that really, you know, weren't super well received. My Soul to Take in 2010 was Wes's return to not only directing but writing as well. He hadn't written anything since New Nightmare uh, back in 1994. So he didn't like, you know, he didn't actually do a writer-director film uh, until 2010. And so that was kind of intriguing at that time, right? Like you have Wes coming back. You know, so a lot of his his written films uh, were very successful and um, it's, it's kind of exciting in, in that in that time frame and then unfortunately it you know it, it actually aired theatrically and <laughs> people were pretty disappointed um, it I can see I say I can see now after watching this why people going in scream for would have been hesitant. Yeah, they're like, where like I was like the bu- I was blindly optimistic. Like yeah. Scream Four, that sounds fucking great, and it looks great. They're like, and by the way, for people, if you haven't watched our review on Scream, still great. Get over it. Um, but yeah, I can see that too because they're like, one year previously, they're like, I got burned, I got fucking burned on a Wes Craven movie with my soul to take. I uh, nearly took my soul and got out of the theater. <laughs> On that one, 
I don't even remember. I I don't think that played around here. I don't even I remember don't, that. You I know, honestly getting... don't really remember. To be honest, you know, I, I at that time, what, how old was I? Uh, we were twenty one. We were yeah. so like, just getting out of college. Yeah, I don't really remember it either. But the thing about this movie too is that it got it got caught up in the three D craze. Right, it got so th- oh, at this time. It just slap that on. There. Yeah, at this time, like not so. Not only does it have like the Wes Craven returns writing for this Wes Craven style slasher movie, um, but it has the 3D element to it too. To to like even cement it more so in in the you know early 2010s, um, it got caught in the 3D craze. And if you think back to, like, uh, the 3D movies that were coming out at the time, a lot of them were not, like, designed to be in 3D at the, at the beginning of their, um, their inception. It was more like, hey, the 3D is doing pretty well on, like, My Bloody Valentine 3D. Why don't we take my soul to take and put it in 3D? And, the, and you know, like, th- that never really ended up being a director's decision. It was always production who was like, yeah, this sounds like a great Sh- idea. I think everybody the, everybody wants to see in, things in 3D. Let's say shove it in post-production. Yep. And as somebody who can't see 3D, um, thank God that trend, that trend ended. Because I, I will never forget going to see Coraline in 3D and just <laughs> like, sitting there. What? It's, there's 3D things happening? Where? Halfway, halfway through the fucking movie being like, have you guys seen any 3D? I haven't. I haven't seen anything. Uh, yeah, dude. A lot of things have happened. A lot of things have happened. <laughs> and like being like, great. I knew I really couldn't see it because I remember being like, earth science class, like uh, with a 3D topographical view where you get to see like through the lens and it makes the cartography map like kind of pop out. And sitting there. And being like, I can't see it. And the guy, the teacher also had a lazy eye like me, too, coming up to me. He's like, you are, you're just like me. <laughs> you shared in a bonding <laughs> experience at that time. Bonding, yeah, yeah. But, like, you know, like, the same thing, too. Like, seeing, like, Star Trek in the darkness. <clears throat> For whatever reason, when we went, I would be in my friend Matt went to go see it. You know, our friend Matt, I should say. Went to go see it. Assholes only offering it in 3D. I was like, motherfucker, I don't want to have to strain my eyes for two and a half hours. I didn't watching. realize that one was in 3D. They, they shoved it in there. Yeah. Shoved it in there. It's, so like, it's I, the same same idea with my soul to take. So I we saw that, you know, in 3D. Had to because the only way they were offering it. And we were the only two in the theater. And thank God, because that was the only way it was in, that film was enjoyable to watch because otherwise it would have just been grainy looking film and we were just making fun of it the entire time because if you haven't seen Star Trek in the darkness it's just a shitty remake of uh, Wrath of the Khan so that's a total sidebar yeah that is really funny though that you just you can't see 3D and you just kind of like experienced a 3D movie in 2D even though it was supposed to be in 3D. Not even it's 2D. Great. It's not even 2D because it's it's grainy because it's got the overlaying images. That's so true, you're just, yeah. You're just sitting there. <laughs> your eyes are straining to see, and you're like, great. Now I'm just like, do I wear these glasses like an asshole and not see what I'm supposed to see? Or yeah. do I just say, fuck it, and but then have a grainy, you know. Uh, I will say, I'm like. Say, I'm, I'm, I'm so glad that trend died. I'm. Well, there were some good movies in 3D that, like, actually made use of the technology. I remember one that I went to go see, um, the, you know, the Jim Carrey A Christmas Carol that was in 3D was truly made for 3D. And that one really did capture the feel of being in 3D. Like, there's a, a scene where he, like, falls through the sky and, like, hanging on for dear life. Holy shit, we're flying through the fucking air here. That was very, very um, successful in how it, it portrayed the 3D elements um, my soul oh, to take, wh- man, you know, that, why- I'll say that's a, that's what we need to do for Christmas this year. What's that? Just like every iteration mm. of Christmas Carol. That would be fun. Funny, actually. <laughs> Just like, I'm so sick of this fucking storyline. <laughs> this is the same thing over and over again. <laughs> the the <laughs> Dickens story that can't, will never die. That would Go be, from, like, that actually we'll do would that. be pretty funny. <laughs> We'll do that. It's a wonderful yeah. life, and you know that would be funny. <laughs> but yeah, but like with my soul to take, like I didn't realize when I you know when I was watching it that it was actually a 3D. You know, it was made. It wasn't made to be 3D. It was it was shot for 2D, and then like I said, production was like, you know, what would be a great idea. Let's just make this movie 3D. So they did the post production 3D, and watching this movie now, thinking back, I can't really think of a single scene where I think like, wow, that would have been good in 3D. <laughs> 
Can you? No, it's all really lazy. Yeah. And I... you can tell when it's the lazy 3D, too, because it's, like, extra pronounced. Like, look! This knife is stabbing through her, and he's getting lifted up, and the blood should be shooting everywhere. I, don't, you know? I, can't, even, I can't even really think of anything. What, what? Well, I guess we can talk about that later, but... Like I said, it was it was caught up in that 3D craze, and you know from that alone, you're like, this movie's gonna be a soul suck. Um, so we'll talk about that when we get into the movie uh, proper. But first, let's take if, Bla- if Black Christmas 2005 with Lacey Chabert was in 3D. <laughs> Woo! Be the film, the pointies. <laughs> All right, let's take a break real quick, and we'll talk about the beer that we have on the show today, which is technically not beer. It's technically not a beer this time. We wanted to do something different. Actually, Martin uh, proposed, hey, let's do something that's not beer because we don't generally do that. So um, what did we get, Martin? So usually, at least, like, I think almost every year when it comes to the fall, we have done a cider at least once, mm. kind of throw, throwing it on the dock because it's like, hey – we're in upstate New York, prime cider country. So let's do a cider. Yeah. So I was thinking about, we have done, um, today we have on uh, the program, 1911, brought to you by Beacon Skiff Orchards, which is down in Lafayette, which is near Syracuse. Um, we have done some of their ciders before. Uh, the one that comes most to mind is the Maple Donut. I am pretty sure we did, like, two, three years ago? Something like that, yeah. I would say, whenever you, exactly I say, when. I say, whenever you moved into your second house, because I remember, <laughs> you know, we had it in your basement, so. Oh, okay, yeah, so, like, probably three years ago. Yeah, so, yeah. So, we've, had, you know, we've done at least a cider, like, maybe once a year. And I do like hard cider, um, but because, in my mind, I kind of pack it in with fall with like Oktoberfest with fall even though it's something I do regularly enjoy and I could drink all year I only have it like a couple times during the fall because it, I like to have that nice you know oh fall time is mm-hmm. here let's have a cider right um so we do have 1911 again um and I was looking for this year they have a candy corn uh, hard cider and I wanted that for the program because I hate candy corn but that just sounds <laughs> you know like what? I gotta get this I hate but it I, but mm. just because it's, that sounds unique yeah. and you know and different and because candy corn to me just tastes like nothing but sugar like dull rotting sugar so I was curious about it but unfortunately we live too far out of uh, central New York we did not get it so I did not get it. So instead, we have a, their Honeycrisp Cider. So for those of you who are apple assholes and apple idiots and don't know, a Honeycrisp is a type of apple. Do people not know that? Uh, well. Yeah, I think it's pretty common. Um, it's not like one of those hybrids. Like an Arkansas Black or something fancy. I don't even know what an Arkansas Black is, to be honest with you. It's a type of apple. Learning that from Sam Cedar. Oh, interesting. No, I mean, I think Honeycrisp is pretty, like, it, you know, they definitely sell them in the grocery store. It's something that you can get pretty pretty frequently. And I just had a Honeycrisp apple not too long ago. And I can say well, pretty confidently well, somebody, that this. I say, somebody, I say, somebody who works in a grocery distribution center. Yes, I do see Honeycrisp apples lying around. Yeah. <laughs> I would say that this is a very um, authentic representation of a Honeycrisp apple. It like hits all the, the specs of a Honeycrisp apple. It's got... I'm no I say I'm no apple connoisseur, so I couldn't tell you. I don't like... Apples are one of the fruits that I like, but I, I'm not going to sift through all the different varieties to be like, which one's the best? You know, the one thing that... The thing that I get from this that I think is really interesting is like when you drink it, you do get like that... You know, you get a like a nice... Uh, tart apple cider flavor to it but at the end after you swallowed and you kind of just are you know it's sitting in your mouth a little bit that's where you really get that honey crisp flavor because I find that when I eat a honey crisp I have that same flavor at the end like after I swallowed the bit of apple 
you get like this flavor of um, brown sugar. Yeah, like brown sugary honeyness to it. Um, and I think this one captures it really well. It's surprising because I could see, and sometimes it does, like especially with like 1911, sometimes apple ciders can, especially when they're trying to like capture a specific feel or, or taste, sometimes they can um, come off as very cloying, um, too sweet, too pronounced of like a sugariness to it to try to like make up for the, the tartness that's inherent in the apple. And this does not have that. And they, they've done a really good job with this one. Yeah, I'd agree. As, as in, especially, like I said, I'm... I, like I said, I like apples, but Lord knows, I. if you were to have me to, like, name and bite into apples, it wouldn't be my game. I like it a lot. As Ryan and I were discussing before we had it, when we have ciders, the two things we kind of... We like dry you know, crisp ciders. We don't like overly sweet ciders. Yep. The honey, This honey crisp is delightful because it is dry. It is crisp, but it is refreshing, and you get a nice... And I take a swig. <laughs> mild sweetness to it that as you drink it, as that sip kind of goes through does become sweeter and sweeter but it's not overly sweet it's very brown sugary honey gentle sweetness that it kind of rolls into it gives you a nice warmth yeah this is a delightful cider yeah i would buy this all the time in the fall because if i were to sit around a campfire and be like i want a nice cider to go with tonight this would be one this is great i like it a lot yeah i think like like you said, I do like those dry tart ciders a lot more than anything that's extremely sweet. Um, and 1911 can actually be pretty hit or miss in terms of their cider output. I've I've had some really good ones from this, like the Honeycrisp. I've had some really bad ones, like uh, they made like a seltzer cider. Pack, oh, that and those awful. were Who Yeah, those were not that good. <laughs> uh, those were a definite miss. Um, and I'm, you know, I, I don't know if they're even making those anymore. They were they were definitely like strange uh especially because they had weird flavors too like mango apple seltzer cider and uh like an orange apple seltzer cider if you've had ciders too you know sometimes ciders can taste like vomit if you don't do them right um i had a woodchuck pumpkin cider one time and that definitely oh, that, that tasted like, absolutely like barf that was like 12 years ago yeah. Jesus christ that completely just tasted like barf so if you if you don't get the the flavor profile right the the nice crispness of an apple cider can really turn oh into God. like a pukey that's flavor during, <laughs> that's during the chan gailey years above the bills jesus yeah. christ I can, I can remember that kickoff and we're drinking it and you'd be like oh god this is fucking <laughs> and you know what i think after that year i don't think i've seen woodchuck make that so they have <laughs> they might some people like it. Some people do like it, but it, it, I think it's it's partially too like pumpkin can sometimes taste like like vomit. It's like the acidity, and I getting a I pumpkin just... acidity and getting an apple acidity together is like prime for like this tastes like absolutely like bile coming up. I think at ciders though they're just very overall compared to beer. It's much more. There's a lot more than can kind of go wrong because. If there's not much innovation that you can have because it's mm. what is cider? It's hard cider. Mm-hmm. It's, you know your apple cider, but hard. With, you know it's been fermented, so yep. You know it's you can. It's, there's not nearly enough uh, room to kind of innovate that you have with like beer with all the different ways you can kind of ferment. Like here, yeah. it's like. Do you like apple cider? How about apple and pear cider? Like, how about just pear cider, you know? Mm-hmm. And that's the thing, too. I think people like to point out, cider doesn't just mean apple. Say that. Mm-hmm. You can cider many fruits. Cider is just the, the act of taking that fruit and fermenting it. So, But, you know, I, 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 I almost thought about getting an awestruck uh, apple and pear cider. I um I find that pear alone is super watery. It's not it's there's not enough flavor to it to really um 
well, I, make it worthwhile. You have yeah, to add well, something else. I agree because, I mean, we're people who live in the age of Mountain Dew. One of our friends, as we talked about before, Matt, he loves pears. And I go, w- 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 were you born during the Civil War? Like, that would have been, like, a refreshing, sugary treat back in the 1780s. But now, what does a pear have to offer, like, for, like, sugar and, like, tartness and stuff? Nothing. It's just a pear. You're biting in, and you're like, oh, it's incredibly mildly sweet. <laughs> yeah. Mild you know, as soon, as soon as you gave your kid, like, an ice cream cone, they're never going to look back. Yeah, no, but I like this 1911 Honeycrisp a lot. I think it's really a very, very solid cider. It's perfect for fall. And it's when I think of a really good cider, uh, this is one that I'm going to think of. I'm, gl- I'm glad that we got this one to try. It's, it's, it's really solid. You're welcome. <laughs> and, and take that, candy corn. We didn't need you anyway, candy corn cider. Who knows? We probably would have hated that one. I, I'm I still would try it just because it's I'm so. I'm still gonna. I would still like to try it as well. Because I'm curious to what the fuck, like what the fuck does that even entail? Mm-hmm. I'm afraid that it's gonna be like so sweet, so sickly sweet. That's my fear. All right, so let's talk about my soul to take. Let's my not. soul to take. Yeah, you don't let's really <laughs> want to talk about it, do you? This is a tough, <laughs> tough movie to talk about. I will say that I think that the idea that Wes Craven had for this movie is interesting, and he has a lot of different ideas and themes that are going on in this movie. This movie Too is many. yeah, right, exactly. This movie has so many ideas that it doesn't know what to do with them all, um, and I think that's one of the main problems with my with this movie is that it really just has too much going on and too so it's weird too because this movie has too much going on it's a very strange movie in how it presents all those things and yet it's a really boring movie too i don't i don't know how that happens how does that happen how do you get such a such a boring and w- my favorite word to use right now tepid <laughs> movie out of so many ideas that Wes Craven's bringing to it cuz it, it's like the ungodly mishmash of all of Wes's cliches and also the mid 2000s horror cliches. Right. Like this film is like nonstop on. The, you get you get everything the, from Wes. The, the trope train. It's like <laughs> yeah. you know, just hop on. <laughs> like, yeah. hey, you want the hard cuts? You got the hard cuts. Do you want the? Jump scares for nothing? Like, hey, what's going on? <laughs> hey, what's going on? Hey, I am just happened to be in this closet. Were you weren't <laughs> expecting it, were you? <laughs> hey, you you want red herrings that don't make sense? <laughs> Got him. <laughs> Why is that? We employed a guy just to blow the train horn. <laughs> you're, it's like you're at a Bills game and it's third down. <laughs> you know, you got that Amtrak whistle playing. I think you know what you're getting into right right from that intro that, Dude, that opening no, scene no that, no see here's the problem that that intro i mean yeah you are but at the same time it's such a massive clusterfuck of nonsense that <laughs> none of it makes sense i know, it, I know and it's so hard there's so many hard cuts throughout it like, it's honestly, so, i will say like, it's on it's honestly like i only at that point I don't even blame Wes because he did he edit it because if he didn't edit it, it's not even his fault. Like that, you know, you got all these like fucking smash cuts just thrown in there. Wes was like, "All right, we've got a we've got this laid out for you. We've got re- like really nice transitions here. Uh, here's the storyboard. It's very clear where we're going with this." And the editor's like, "You know what? I got my own ideas. It's <laughs> it's, just, it's cut to this. Cut to this guy having a psychotic episode. Wait, now he's back to normal. Wait, now there's a kid in the bed. Wait, now. that that opening is such a fucking like evidence, evanescence, alter bridge. Oh, like, like a music like, video sort of thing. Yeah, yeah I can see that because like, it has the blue tint. It has it has all that." That you would expect from like the two thousands music video of just like yeah somebody somebody like like editing that with ADHD. You're just imagining somebody yell, "Where are you?" 
and I'm so sorry. <laughs> it's just, it's yeah, no, it's I, awful. It's I it, think it's like it's if awful. You, if, if you have anxiety, that opening scene right there is gonna make you just or a seizure. Yeah, yeah. You're, prone to you, seizures. you're gonna like start just tremor trembling because it's. And honestly, my wife has like these. She has like a um an issue with like loud noises and like hypersensitivity to noise and the the movie wasn't even really that loud to be honest with you um like the volume itself but like this this opening scene is just like so much stuff happening smash cuts and smashing sounds and sound effects and explosions and ambulances and gunshots and um stabbings literally everything every sound is taken to the max here so like this opening that's why i said if you have anxiety, this is going to, like, trigger you so hard when you're watching it. There's just so much happening. Like I said, though, I think it gets you ready for this movie because it's like, this is going to be an insane movie. This is going to be really difficult to st- to stomach. Yeah, but not for the right reasons. Not for the not right like reasons. But not I, like, I think oh, it gets, diffi- No, I think it gets you prepared. I, I think what, what they were going for in this opening was like, wow. This is there's so much happening. It's so crazy. Like there's an ambulance that's crashed, and there's there's just stabbings and shootings, and this guy keeps coming back to life. Like you you're you're thinking, wow, that's so amazing. That's so cool. But really, the viewer's like, what the fuck is happening? What? There's not only that, but you get like ridiculous one-liners constantly in the beginning too. And I don't I don't think that this was the successful venture. For the introduction that this that the movie really truly oh, wanted. <laughs> hey, yeah, he's dead. No, it's just souls being taken. What? Oh. Hey, can we talk too about uh, Denai Guerrera here? Who you know she's from the you know most known for The Walking Dead now, Michonne from The Walking Dead. But here she plays this uh, detective, Jean Baptiste, and really at the beginning of the movie, such a weird introduction to her character. She just comes up and is like, yeah. I'm from Haiti, and this is what I think about when people die. It's so fucking weird. It's like it makes no sense. Oi, oi, I mean, <laughs> hey, oi, I'm boy, the, I'm the token miss... Haitian here. <laughs> oh, Tommy boy, we're gone, we're rude boy. Uh, uh, you know, it, um, like it, no, damn nasty Cubanos. Know, it's like, <laughs> you know, it's, it's it's like Miss Cleo for fucking uh, Vice City, like. Kill them, bad man, you Cubans, Tommy boy. It's it's honestly like <laughs> sort of offensive how they've they played her character up and it's just like she just randomly comes up like yeah I happen to be a black cop happen to be from Haiti. Here's what we think about voodoo and stuff. It's like so weird. No, but there's a bunch of guys that are like you know, like like oh yeah, now that guy's finally dead. No, oh, yeah, no, 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 that's his soul. He's got many souls. Yeah, because like what they think he's like schizophrenic. So schizophrenia, multiple personalities. That obviously means he has souls in him. It's it's a it's a so like that's what you know. Wes is going for. That's the theme of my soul to take is that schizophrenia, mental illness can sometimes you know manifest with multiple personalities, and those personalities might be souls. And the film kind of takes it from there and says like, is it possible that? the souls can be sucked into one person's body and that's what becomes like their ultimate mental illness and um i don't honestly like i think that the idea is interesting but i don't think that the film really does a very good job with it at all it doesn't um emphasize this idea too often and its main character which it follows after the after this crazy introduction after this ripper character dies which again that was the name that they came up for the for this for for this murder. This Ripper. Mass murderer. They were like the they, Ripper. Yeah, they were like, um, I don't know. Has the Ripper been done before? No, I don't think that name's been used. Um, maybe only the well, most iconic they, serial killer. What in a history. fucking Mennonite name for him too, Abel Plinkov. <laughs> like, who's who's the Ripper? Abel Plinkov. Yes, he helped. He helped my. His sister knitted a bag for me the other day and helped raise me a barn the other day too. <laughs> I yeah, I just I just like the name that they came up for him though. It's like they couldn't it's, come up with something like you, unique you know, and spooky. You Ripper. know what? I'm say you know what the whole opening reminds me of? Poor WWE storytelling. 
Oh yeah, this, right. This, like this would like you know fit totally within like a WWE film. Like see no evil. Yeah, or like you know just anything on like uh, Monday Night Raw during the time period they would have fucking probably thrown on there, mm-hmm. you know, because Vince McMahon would have been like, yes, that's great, great shit. Yeah. Well, yeah, souls. I mean, see, see, no was, see no evil was a WWE film. So. Yeah, no, I know. I can see that. But I mean I think that Wes had some 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 cool things here. I think like you know, if we were to take this and and if this was given a little bit more time to be molded and shaved down cuz it is an hour and 47 minutes this fucking long ass film. Uh like so super unnecessary to be that long except for the fact that there's so many ideas crammed into here that they have to give source so, like some time to each of those ideas like there's a really weird random scene of our main character um actually we we haven't even described it's hard to describe this movie but like the the main idea is that 16 years after the ripper is killed and they're not even sure that he's dead or not like no one did their due diligence they're like is he, is he fucking in is he in the morgue is he not in the morgue where is he no one knows they pull the Halloween. Look. Yeah. Hey, it's Michael Dada. He's in an ambulance. Like, like yeah. the, the coroner was like, oh, it's not my job. I don't know. He's around here somewhere. He but, was too busy eating a, tu- a, a tuna yeah, sandwich. Yeah, the, like. He does the generic coroner thing. Uh, I don't know. Let me <laughs> let me just eat my lunch here on this dead body. Um, <laughs> no, but like the, the idea is that there's seven kids that were born on the night that the Ripper in was murdered. Riverdale, Rivertown, River, Rivertown, Riverville, River, River, generic fucking place. Archie, where's Ar- Where's Archie in this film? Bat and kill, whatever, you, <laughs> whatever you want to call this like super generic town that has like a church that lights up dur- until like midnight and then turns off. I don't know. Anyway, these seven kids were born on the same night as the Ripper. They were like born in the hospital. the The hospital's going nuts. Like this is another hospital that actually is staffed. And has which, which in it. no, I say it doesn't make any sense. I thought from films, especially horror films, that uh, nothing happens at night. In, in hospitals, hospitals weren't staffed after six p.m. Like they all pack up and no, go home. No, in this one, they're all like, "Fuck, we got seven babies coming at the same time here." One of, and then I do also like the fact that the the nurse is like kind of perturbed. Like one of them's blind too. <laughs> like, geez, lady. Okay, so he's blind. All right. Well, wait, wait wasn't those blind? Yeah, Jerome. He's blind? <laughs> yeah, this film does not do a very good job of showcasing it. But yes, he yeah. does have the blind cane at one point. Remember? I thought that was to, a joke. No, I he tries to go into the woman's bathroom. No, and no I know. I thought that was a joke. No, yeah. He's, no, li- he's, he's actually, literally blind. Yes. He's actually, wow. He's actually oh blind. God. Because then he comes up at one point and says, they're like, how do you? How did you know I was here or something? And he's like, I can hear you. You didn't catch on? No? All right, well, no, whatever. Because I, but no, the, I, I, the, I, where's the scene of him, like, smacking around, like, up the stairs, like, hey, rip up, p- 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 come, come and get No, yeah, no, he's, he's <laughs> blind, but, like, that's what I, li- I like about that scene, too, is, like, it's kind of just thrown in your face, so the nurse is like, yeah, we got seven babies getting delivered, and one of them's fucking blind. <laughs> it's just so, so ridiculous. That that one's not going to make it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I know. It's whoa, it's 1992. <laughs> They'll definitely make it. Yeah, no, whoa, whoa, not going to make it. Hold on a second. Not let's, ma- let's not do late-term <laughs> abortion right now, okay? The the blind child will be all right. <laughs> if the if the, the school ponies up for Braille no, textbooks, he'll be okay. Do you, I almost think this film's like a metaphor for abortion, too. Instead of having those seven babies, why don't you just abort them? Yeah. Probably a good idea, especially when you're killing off a serial murderer at the same time. No, but the the whole idea is just extremely weird. It's it's almost like um, it's almost like the it's it, like a cross between um, scream. Well, like scream and <laughs> like uh, a part parts of um, uh, the children of the damned. Like village of the damn sort of thing. No, it's weird. No, no, no. You mean you mean children of the corn? We've come for you. Malachi. No, no, no. I mean like you know where the whole town gets 
knocked up at the same time. Yeah, yeah, I know sort of thing what you like fucking that. mean. It's weird. We reviewed it. We reviewed it last It's just year. weird. It's just like a weird idea. And then, so so 16 years later, they all get together, and they're like, the Ripper died well, on this night, and it's our well, birthday. Well, they've been doing it for like eight years. Well, six years before that. This is the seventh year. Bugs the only one who hasn't had to fend off the demon. Yeah, it's like a metaphor for being a man, right? Like, you gotta fight off the demon, the Ripper. And Which is funny. At ten years old, what is it? Stand by me. They're going down to buy <laughs> yeah. the fucking rail, the rail trestles, and being like, "Mogul fight guy, fiki foul. Mogul fight guy, fiki foul. Like, stay away from me, deep." So these these kids are all you know born on the same day. They're sixteen years old now, and they're dealing with the return of the Ripper, um, the anniversary of the Ripper's death, sixteen years ago, and their birthday. Yeah, and, and also <laughs> unlike Scream. Uh, they actually look like uh, high school children. That is true too. Not, yeah, and and not, and not like they're out of place. Yeah, you know, like twenty five year olds. Yeah, no, I I mean, I, at least they, at least there's that going for it. Um, <laughs> they actually look like they're children. But the, I mean, the the idea is weird. The 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 themes that Wes is throwing in here are all over the place. Like. Bug, our main character, played by Max Thero. You probably know him from um, Bates Motel, specifically. Um, he, you know, he is like the the odd guy out. He's not. He's kind of like an anxious kid. He's not super popular. And um, West kind of paints him as a person that might have uh, personality disorder. You know, he, he might have uh, multiple personalities. Fun and, fact from, I say real quick, sorry to interrupt. Fun fra- fact from the Wikipedia page. Uh, he's also a vintner. Ooh. Wow. Yeah. Probably wasn't a vintner during this movie, but he learned to be one. He owns his own vineyards at, uh, in his hometown of Occidental. We'll throw the... What's the vineyard? What's the uh, What's the, the winery that he's got? The, I don't take, know. take a look. It says, it. it says in the third season of Bates Motel on Wikipedia, the main characters can be seen drinking senses during a family dinner scene. Oh. So, senses In- wine. Interesting. But anyway, with <laughs> <laughs> I would check out his wine. I'll, I'll give it a shot. I'm a, I'm a big white wine fan. It's no, it's no, probably no Francis Ford Coppola. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the grapes are all touched by Francis Ford Coppola. How can you... How can you uh, compete with that? Holy uh, shit, he's only 33? Yeah, he's. I mean, he's fairly young. God damn, he's we're a, he's, old. Yeah. But anyway, um, <laughs> like we have Bug, who is, is you know, he, has a, he might have this personality disorder. He's really kind of ostracized from the rest of the seven, except for Al, his friend Alex and Jerome. Jerome's the blind one. And um, you, you never know. The, the weirdness doesn't stop at just like these seven kids um who are being targeted by the ripper 16 years later it, not only that but we also have this weird uh, um storyline about bug's stepsister fang and the film really for about 50 minutes does not make it known like who the fuck fang is like you you have no idea what they're talking about when they say like oh we got to be careful of fang oh fang's having a meeting it's like who the fuck who is fang who is this person why why is the whole town scared of Fang? This 19-year-old kid who's just fairly emo you, and Well, you don't even know that that's who she is for the yeah, longest yeah, time. Yeah, you don't really know. You don't really know who it is at all. You don't know why she doesn't like Bug. You don't know the relationship at all. And the film kind of drops that on you later on and then it drops a whole bunch of exposition cuz Fang is basically like, "You you're the son of the Ripper and I'm the son of I'm the daughter of the Ripper and You've made my life a living hell because everybody likes you better and blah blah blah. I I don't like the the whole fang element to this movie is just super like shoved in here. It's fisted in here. Let's let's call it what it oh, is. It's yeah, fisted, fisted into here. It's really forced. And I think that's, you know, another thing with this movie is that it just really does not have a handle on all of its storylines. There's so much going on. There's a storyline about Bug being obsessed with condors, California condors, which in like Native American folklore, we kind of are told, oh, they like are eaters of souls. And so there's that whole idea of like um, souls being recycled and um, the dead being recycled and Bug taking on those personalities. But it's all really muddled and it doesn't really go anywhere. 
I um, get it. It's it's inspiration for Until Dawn. <laughs> I mean, I I feel like my solo take would have been a lot more successful had it just focused on like one or two of the elements that are in here, and maybe cut out some of Wes's cliched items because. Um, for the for a lot of this movie, it, it you, it's like a greatest hits of Wes Craven movies. Like you get lots of jump scares, you get like uh, night nightmare uh, elements, you get a step a abusive stepfather. Um, you literally that abusive stepfather falls down the stairs, which we just covered in Deadly Friend, like a similar scenario where in in that case it's kind of reversed, you know, where he throws his daughter down the stairs but it's the same idea the abusive step stepfather or abusive father abusive parent some something like that these are all things that we've seen many times in west craven movies and they are done um a lot poorer in in my soul to take than they're done in those other movies um and i think that's probably another big issue that people had with this movie is that it really just feels like a rehash of things that Wes Craven has already done and done much better. And especially like as a teen slasher movie, um, this one is just not up to snuff with like, you can't compete with scream. Um, the only thing it does really have going for it is the kills because it is pretty violent. It is pretty, um, brutal in the way that it murders off its seven characters. You don't think so? I think it's, it's, I saw somebody describe it as aggressive, and I would agree with that. Like, it's, you know, your killer is not just like, oh, I'm going to stab you and leave you for dead. They're pretty brutal. Literally, literally fucking Rob Zombie running about going, <laughs> as he's chasing these people down, like, yeah, I am my Durango. I am on number five. Yeah, I guess that's true. Do you think Do you think that the Ripper's design is scary, or even? No, it's fucking hilarious. It's it, terrible. And I would say that the the design itself too is not. You know, it, you have iconic designs like Freddy, where you th- there's. I think even from a Nightmare on Elm Street, that design was uh, was fairly iconic. With the with the Ripper in my soul to take, it's. I think it's so couched in like shadows, and you can't really see it. Like, how could you even? remember what this character is like it's it's just not memorable at all because it's just like a guy with dirty hair or dreads and running at you with a leather jacket on the first part where he murders jay the the first kid that, that actually ends up dying at the hands of the ripper um is just like the a guy sprinting at him not very uh memorable as a death not uh not too scary it's just uh just happens but i do think that it's you know it's a fairly aggressive movie um in the way that it murders its characters i also kind of liked the whole um scene where Brittany is out like walking and brandon comes up to her and he's like you can give me a blow job now and she runs away through the woods and brandon's running after her um, that's kind of an interesting throwback to the last house on the left in some cases, like the the element of running through the woods while rapists are kind of running after you from behind. No, it is, but again, at the same time, the whole like point system and like I need like ten points and five points and three points and a one billion points for Griffin Puff. Griffin Puff wins, like. It doesn't make any fucking sense. I don't know what the fuck's going on with that. Like, like I'm gonna give him a three. He's getting yeah, like, an eight. Yeah, what the fuck does that? I, like, what the yeah, fuck so does that even mean? So you don't have a scale for your punching system where you're like, all right, if I cock my hand back, you know, two inches, that's a three. If I go no. back five inches, that's an eight. You don't have that no. point no. system. No, I thought everybody had that. That's no. that's like bully 101 in school. Apparently, you weren't a bully. No, it's not Bully 101. I played Bully, and that's not a game. <laughs> Actually, what Brandon has, he has, like, a little um, scale underneath his arm. It's like, it goes from, like, blank red to uh, green. And then when he winds up, it, like, jumps back and forth, and he has to, like, get it in the right spot to, to do an eight. That's what he has. It's like a video game. No, it's a weird moment. It's, it's definitely weird. the The whole idea of like, and it, that's I think that's funny too. He's like, you you 
You asked me for a lot. I had to give this kid a three and an eight, so I deserve a blowjob. It's like, yeah, like, like, dude, you punched the two kids like the same way. <laughs> it was, it was definitely just, a lot of work. It's, it's again, like, it's just weird. Like, what the fuck? Like, I, I, I don't know. What this is Wes Craven's about. alternate reality high school. Not one that uh, I've ever been to, but. Uh, uh, it's just Wes Craven's alternate. <laughs> yeah, Wes <laughs> Craven's is, high school. Yeah. Like, it's, but they seem to cram in, like, every scream and, like, a new nightmare, like, knockoff that they can in this with, like, the jump scares and the, boom, you know, you know, just random, like, what's going on? Like, how do, red how do, you, how do you feel like this school compares to Woodsboro? It's awful. Woodsboro is a college meant for adults going for higher education uh this is not because like woodsboro if you remember is like a ridiculous campus it's like a, unlike a school i've ever seen in in reality right like no i know and but, i think they probably do exist in california like if you go to a really big school maybe whoa whoa your whoa, campus whoa. This is, is like the whoa this is in massachusetts okay <laughs> same place that urban legend took place where they're saying get your slicker ready you know there's a story <laughs> i'm a cut yeah i i've never been to campuses like that for high schools but uh no i mean it's ridiculous i'd be a ridiculous proposition yeah. like thinking about it but like, no, it, it, but it is at the same time. No, it has none of the cachet that Woodsboro has. It's very bland. And again, like, the whole premise in these characters in this movie are what, like, make it weird because everybody's fucking weird. <laughs> like, Everybody and like, weird. And <laughs> like, and everybody's, like, just outside of, like, the the seven who have been blessed by this soul or whatever, they're all fucking weird. Like, oh, Fang, why she, here's her mean girl bit where she's walking with her friends and like, oh, it's so fetch. Everyone loves Britney. Why does everyone love Britney? She's a poor man's Rachel McAdams and we get to see that. Oh, you, you know, here's your Jesus freak. It's, it, it's totally weird. And I, I don't think the fact that, for the most part, that the acting in this film is fucking god-awful, that anyone helps the message along the way, either. It's like, it's just one incredulous mess that just keeps on a truck, and they want to hit every fucking West Beat there is, and they're going to fucking hit it whether you want it to or not. Yeah. What do you think about the, the reveal at the end? Of you know the actual killer, the 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 soul, the whoever has the soul of the Riverton Ripper. Did you pick him? I don't think he. Who'd you I, pick? I don't know. I didn't pick anybody because I was just like, I wasn't really invested in who was the killer. Honestly, it's not that invest. You're right in the fact that it's not that investing. Like, there's three routes that you can kind of go when picking who's the actual killer. You can pick our our lead. And he's on a fever dream. You can pick that it's his sister, which I was kind of going with because, like, you know, like that'd make the most sense revenge wise. Like, she's been tormented, you know. Or you can make go the third route and it be kind of like all oh, like just a revenge fantasy in his head like overall like you know he's imagining these things because of his past and mm -hmm. it's not actually happening those are kind of the three things that i was kind of uh picking out they went to billy loomis route here which makes sense because it's wes you know and even at times when they made sure when he's you know his friend Alex is talking, like, to give him the kind of the Billy Loomis, like, smirks and shit, like, you know, like, oh, yeah, you didn't see that coming, did you? You didn't see that coming. We can take care of, care of everybody. Kill them all. Let's kill them all. There was, all, all that was missing was uh, a friendly face. Like, yeah, man, let's fucking do it. 
Yeah, I mean, where I, where was our Matthew Lillard in this film? I I don't think the reveal is, you know, it's not it's not super surprising, but I again I don't think that it is. Um, you're not invested. There's right, nothing like, in. There's right. no hook. Yeah, there is not, and you're just kind of like, okay, uh, I'll go with that. <laughs> you know, it's it's you don't really care that much. And I, I think that's, you know, a problem with the movie is that you don't really care who the killer is. And it, ultimately, it doesn't really matter who the killer is. And um, at the end, I think that, you know, it, it's trying to make a, a statement about who's a hero and who thinks they're the hero. Who's a man? Um, but I just feel like that the whole thing kind of misses out on um, being a successful slasher because – you don't care about the characters you don't care about the killer and for the most part it's a pretty boring movie to sit through as you just wait for an hour and 40 minutes to find out who this guy is i I, like i I feel like the ripper should be a lot more interesting than it it is and again the ending is too gripped on screen Mm -hmm. where like it's like who did it and then when you find out who did it, it's like, okay. But it's there's no, like you said, there's no hook. And there's no real overall motivation. It's just like, let's hit those scream beats of like, you know, of scream one, scream two of like, this is, you know, the path that we take without any of the excitement and intrigue along the way. Because mm-hmm. the people that he kills along the way, you don't give a shit. We're not, we don't have any interaction with them enough to give a shit. It's just, okay, be gone. So, there's a lot of, again, there's a lot of scream beats in this film. But they don't ever work because you you, you don't have any investment into the people in this film. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I... I, I agree. I don't I don't think it does a good job with any of that. And I think there's just too many loose ends in this movie. I know I know some people do like this movie. I think they, they, they like they find it interesting for some reason. I don't personally. I don't find this movie enjoyable like at all. Um from the very first moment it's kinda like uh this is gonna be a taxing situation and it's- the very definition of a slog. Yeah, and then like as you go through, it, you know, and it kind of jumps from theme to theme and goes through weird character elements. Um, you don't really like it, for me. It just doesn't hold my attention, and uh, I was literally almost falling asleep at at times. Um, even during like the more quote unquote inten- intense elements, like at the house um, towards the end of the movie. Uh, those did just did not hold my attention, and I I think that um, the movie is just really ultimately bland, has not a lot of uh, like excitement to it. Even though it has a lot of ideas, it just doesn't do anything with them, and it relies a lot on exposition to get those things across. Because it's like you said, you didn't even rec- recognize the one kid was blind. It just like things that should be apparent to the viewer just aren't and i think that makes it really hard to take in this movie and understand what it's trying to say and i don't think that wes's writing here was um uh strong enough to you know to make this movie successful needed an editor yeah absolutely it did like a a better editor he he needed somebody better kind of skimming through to kind of make sure that you know and not only a better editor from like a writing standpoint but a better editor to make this not like a music video of just like cut to cut um like it needed it needed more cement to it is what i feel like just more more within each of the scenes to like give more um more like characterization without having it be exposition it just needed more and it's weird because it's an hour and 47 minutes but i'm saying it needed more it needed less themes and more elsewhere to really like get this point across it's an odd movie it really is it's truly a weird movie and uh 
I think people should see it. I think they should see it as a Wes Craven movie that just wasn't as successful and kind of analyze where Wes's writing here um, went wrong versus, you know, something like Scream 4 where he returns to like meta commentary where it kind of gets more simplistic again. Um, you know, get simplistic, but put in that like meta-ness to it that, that gives it um, such a like a, a difference in, in a slasher movie. Um, did we touch on everything that you wanted to get to? Dude, honestly, I mean, it's not, not going to lie. Not too much I want to go to it. <laughs> yeah, you're like, you're like, that's it. I'm done. <laughs> All right, so. I, I've been, I've been, <laughs> and I, unlike Ryan, I watched this, uh, like an hour and a half, two hours before, uh, reviewing it. So I'm already tapped out. You're like, film. yeah, I'm done. Like, the, the, I've hit my limit of my soul to take tonight. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so on a scale of um, 0 to 10, Dennis Boutsikaris' as the principal and not Rich Schweikert. <laughs> what about what about uh, the mother being Gretchen from Breaking Bad? Yeah, uh, Jessica Hesht being the mother in this movie. That's that's a joke. We're we're a Better Call Saul podcast, not a Breaking Bad podcast. That's right. Though we love Breaking Bad. Better call Saul's where it's at. Mm-hmm. I'll give it a four and a half. Okay. This is a slog of a film. It has no right to be an hour and 47 minutes. Wes needed somebody to reel him in. Wes needed somebody to kind of give him a more focused vision. There, the idea of a serial killer who comes back... Because he's not actually schizophrenic. He's been imbued with different souls. So that's a very cool and interesting idea. But I think wild horses always run free on. And without having somebody to be kind of like a critical eye to kind of bounce off of on this, we see kind of the fault in that. And... I think Wes definitely could have benefited from somebody kind of viewing and seeing the ideas and refining it. Because Wes's best films have always had great ideas that he's come up with. But somebody to kind of be back there to be like, no, this how we kind of rein it in a little bit. Um, it's like I said, it's, it's, it's an interesting idea. But it overstays its welcome. The kills are very bland. The Ripper is incredible. It's like, like I said, it's literally Rob Zombie running around being, Hey, I'm on the Rango. Hey, I'm on the fire. Go see House of a Thousand Corpses, motherfucker, or you die. You know. Um, the characters in this film are bland. None of them really you can gravitate to. There's no Sydney here. There's no Freddy here. There's no Johnny Depp or anything. It's bland. Soulless. A lot of the blood effects are CGI in a time where they shouldn't even be CGI, but they did it to make it go as Brian said with 3D. Yeah. <clears throat> very soulless. The blood comes across. Are bad. Yeah, it comes across as very lazy. Though I don't really think it's. A, a factor of laziness, I think it's more of a factor of the time and production and trying to make it 3D. I, I don't see the merit in watching this film. I would say totally say stay away from it because it, it is it's the first time in a while. It's a total slog. I had a hard time sitting down watching this fucking movie. Um, and if I saw this before going into Scream 4, probably would have been scared. <laughs> Um, thankfully, Scream 4 is a great film, and Wes, you know, gets to have the last laugh. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's, if we were to care, compare it to Deadly Friend, which, you know, was a production mess, I, I would say this is the failure where Deadly Friend's a success, because Deadly Friend, though, 
muddled in production hell. It has a heart and a soul to it that's enjoyable and endearing. And this is... This movie just reeks of sci-fi, made-for-TV bullshit that's not going to stand the test of time. So I'd say a four and a half. Hmm. I would probably I would give it a five. Like I'm I'm right there with you. I think that this movie is not super enjoyable. Um, it I mean it has an insanity to it that I think might make it endearing to some people. Like just to watch it and be like, wow, the themes are all over the place. But for me personally, I didn't find it interesting. I found it rather boring actually. Uh, even with the kills, um, I don't think that they did a good job as a slasher movie. Really like selling the characters at all. And I feel like the film has so much going on and so many weird character ideas that it really doesn't know where to land. Um, it doesn't feel written like a like a slasher movie in the fact that like th- these characters don't feel real at all. Like the the one character Penelope is like a weird uh, religious chick at 16 years old. <laughs> Uh, speaking in Old Testament language, it just it doesn't feel like authentic. It's just really strange. Um, the movie doesn't do a good job of explaining a lot of ideas. Kind of just leaves them hanging. And ultimately, I don't think that the reveal for the killer is interesting at all. And definitely not worth spending an hour and 47 minutes waiting to get there. Um, so I think you're right. I think Wes needed to be reined in a little bit said, hey, Wes, can you, like, clear up some of these themes you got going on? And we need to, like, kind of consolidate them a little bit. Like, we don't need that whole scene with the uh, the California condor shitting on people in class. Um, you don't uh, say, you know what I will say? Sorry to interrupt. This film, I can see the parallels with Scream 5. Mm-hmm. With the whole, like, you know, family relations and, like, you know, sordid past with the killer and, like, flashbacks and seeing things like you know the whole billy i'm billy loomis's unborn daughter you know mm-hmm. so maybe when they were writing scream five they're like hey what if we what if we borrowed from my soul to take so no like to borrow from my soul <laughs> and somebody was just like sure whatever yeah i mean i i think it's <laughs> an like it's an interesting movie to see one time and see what wes craven did with this but I don't think that most people will end up liking it. And if you did think that this was, like, a really good movie, I kind of question why. Like, I'm, I'm going to need you to tell me specifically. They're the same how. people who enjoyed, even though they cried when Chester Beddingfield bit the dust. They're like, I loved them in Saw 7. Or yeah. Saw 8 or I, I, I'm just going to need an explanation. I'm going to need, like, specifically, in specifics, please, in a three or four paragraph essay, please tell me what it is that you saw that was a redeeming quality in my soul to oh, take I, I saw what you did there with saw look at that in the screen poster for the 2022 one how can you not love nev campbell look at that j- canadian jawline of strength <laughs> scream six coming soon oh my god don't say that it's not it's not stop, stop while you Stop while you're you didn't just destroy the whole series, right? You already killed Dewey. I know. Right. Where where else is there to go? Okay. All right. All right. Well, that's all. But I mean, but I was, I was gonna say that it, it it is like the incredible poor man Z list screen film mm-hmm. with like the cuts and the kills and the idea that whole third act is literally scream one but mine sons you know our favorite comedic actor traipsing about Mm -hmm. telling everyone like i'm feeling woozy man (laughs) yeah did you get that vibe while watching it? Like, like it was like the third act of Scream, like when they're debate, ha- having the little debate up in the... Yeah. I mean, I <laughs> did like, get that, but it was definitely, you, you know, not as, not as good. You're just sitting there like, where's Matthew Lillard? Yeah. Yeah, I, uh, I, I just... I, this is definitely not one I'm going to return to. That's for sure. All right, so so that's all we got for my soul to take. Um, what? That's it. 
fucking Hayden pants in the air, survive Scream 4, and they're putting her in Scream 6? Yeah, they're, yeah, I think so, yeah. And wh where's Nev? Where's Lady carrying the franchise Nev? She's not on the, the list. Courtney Cox is up there front and center, but where is Nev? I don't know why you're laughing. This is serious business. Nev's not going to be in Scream 6. Why not? Because it's contracts and stuff. Give her all of Saskatoon. Who cares? So, yeah. So, um... If you have to say, if, if you've forgotten, Ryan's team, JLH, which is wrong. Team Nev. <laughs> so... With that said, we've, we finished off my soul to take. So we're done. We're done with Wes Craven. And we're finishing up with the Cronenberg. Um, Can't, couldn't, couldn't give Wes a good note to go out on. Nope, no, nope, we had to end on, <laughs> on maybe one of his worst movies. <laughs> um, so we're going to finish up with Cronenberg. And did we decide what we were going to end up doing? I have no fucking idea. I think... I think we had decided that we were gonna go with Dead Ringers, if I remember correctly. Sure. You don't want to do Dune? Mm, David Cronenberg did not direct Dune, so. Yeah, he did. No. Yeah. Uh, no. David Lynch yeah. did. <laughs> <laughs> Same guy. One's from Canada, one's from New England. Or the other thing was that we had talked about maybe the dead zone. Either one is fine with me. <laughs> well, you know, uh, Dead Ringers has Jeremy Irons. Yeah. You know. And, Either way, uh, we're doing a dead and, movie, I guess. And then the dead zone has... Uh, Christopher Walken. Yeah. So... I don't remember that being in the uh, USA back in the day. And you know what, though? Dead Ringers also has Stephen Lack, so. Ooh. <laughs> so we get him back after Scanners. Stop, Maybe in the don't. seven years between Scanners and Dead Ringers, he's perfected his uh, acting. Though. Stop. Don't. Wait. Wait. What? <laughs> the Dead Zone second. lasted five years? Yeah. I don't remember. Jesus Christ! Six season. So I guess we'll I guess we'll figure it out offline. You know what I was thinking about? How did? Why are they bringing Quantum Leap back on NBC just for money? Yes. Oh. Because they can. Because they have the rights to it. I kept seeing ads on YouTube for like, uh oh, you don't want to watch all of this video because I'm stuck in time. Just skip and I'll jump to somewhere else. Mm -hmm. Remember Quantum Leap? You don't? Oh, remember Quantum Leap? Good times. Quantum Leap. Quantum Leap. Quantum Leap. Quantum Leap. All right, well. Tune in next time for our Cronenberg movie, which we haven't decided on. And if you want to hear all that stuff... We're going to do Mulholland Drive next, right? <laughs> oh, wait, no. That's Lynchian. David Lynch. <laughs> that's David Lynch. Fuck. Craving what about some Twin Cronenberg Peaks? and one time some Lynch. What about Twin Peaks? Yeah. All right, so uh, if you like what you've heard so far, I don't know why you what about like what you've heard. As Martin goes off on we, tangents. <laughs> what? It, Existence. What if we did <laughs> the X Files episode with the second dog of the lake in there? No, it's Sikandiga. Sikandiga. Sikandiga the lake. Um, yeah, so if you liked what you heard, <laughs> listen to us on our podcasts, uh, apps. We're pretty much on everything. So we We're can, done at this point. Yeah. You can find us on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, our home base at anchor.fm, uh, Good Pods, pretty much everything. Uh, subscribe to us on there. Leave us a nice review. It always helps us out. We're on Twitter and Facebook. You can just find us on there. Search for Blood and Black Rum Podcast. And we also have a, an email address at bloodandblackrumpodcast at gmail.com. 
write to us. Write it, let us know what you like, what you don't like, uh, what movies you want us to cover, and we'll definitely take that into consideration. Uh, then we have a Patreon page at patreon.com slash podcast where you can donate to us. Uh, you know what? Let's, let's, let's do the episode of X-Files where they land in Northville. Yeah. 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 Let's do, you know, let's do the X-Files movies. All of them. Are they three now? I think. Too many. Yeah. Too many is the answer. All right. That's it. That's all I got. I, I lied. How about Evolution with David Duchovny? <laughs> you going to end this or what? <laughs> I don't want to after watching this movie. Yeah. I feel like that. <laughs> let's talk about anything else. All right. Take care. Ha, ha, ha.